Something happened along that journey where I realized I want to work harder. I want to understand what it looks like to kind of be obsessed with academia and actually do well. I knew that I wanted to be successful. I knew that I wanted to work hard. At the time, I just didn't really know how to do it. Hey guys, welcome back to the Back Yourself Show. This is our first one back in the studio. Don't worry, it's all COVID safe. Um, here we have Joe Binder. He is the founder and CEO of WOW, which is I don't know, it's pretty impressive. Um, he's had an amazing career and I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. So go back to tell me about... So you were at uni and you decided you liked this show that you saw elsewhere and you started creating your own thing. That's how you got into the YouTube jam. So it goes deeper than that. I was never meant to go to Cambridge. I was always a dumb kid at school. I was a kid in bottom sets. My friends would take the piss out of me the entire time. That was the banter. Were they bantering you just for being stupid or were they bantering you for just other things as well? No, sure, <laughs> other things as well. But the main thing was that I was the thicko. Yeah. Um, you know, awful test results, always in bottom sets and, and so on. And something happened along that journey where I realized I want to work harder. I want to understand what it looks like to kind of be obsessed with academia and actually do well. I knew that I wanted to be successful. I knew that I wanted to work hard. At the time, I just didn't really know how to do it. And also I didn't feel like I had the infrastructure around me and the infrastructure in that case was being in bottom sets and therefore only being allowed to actually take certain papers. Like the highest I could have got in maths, for example, was a C at yeah. GCSEs had I not moved up in sets. Um, so to cut a very long story short, I started to swap my lunch breaks for revision in the library. I started to swap um, seeing friends on Friday after school for doing extra work um, and asking teachers to very kindly mark it. Um, and eventually, when it came to university time, I ended up getting into Cambridge University, which was a massive shock. Um, and you know, for me, that was a solid piece of evidence the fact that if you can work your ass off, there will be results and it will pay dividends down the line. So when I got the offer, that's when the imposter syndrome hit. Yeah, I was bet. like, oh God, I'm going to be going to Cambridge University. Everyone there is going to be so much smarter than I am. What the hell am I going to do? And I actually typed into Facebook at the time because everyone was on Facebook back then. I was like, students of Cambridge, expecting there to be a page similar to Brandon Stanton's Humes of New York where he would essentially walk around the streets of New York, find interesting humans, take a photo of them and find a really kind of engaging, compelling story, um, and then upload the photo alongside a caption, something that they've said in the interview. And I just, for some reason, naturally expected that there, that there would be one for Cambridge students, and there wasn't. And I was a little bit disappointed because I just thought, what better way of dispelling all of the myths, all of the insecurities I have about the typical Cambridge student than actually seeing real Cambridge students in quite an authentic way. So I made it my mission. I said to myself, as soon as I get there, I'm starting this. And that's what I did. Amazing. So let, let, okay, let me, I mean, you've given me a lot to talk about there. So first of all, I love that. Like there's, it's that weird thing, isn't it? Where the, the solution to like achievement, like it's just, working hard, being consistent and continually learning those, that three C approach. Um, you just showed that there's no, I don't, I don't believe in like stupid people or whatever. They just got lazy, you know, and if you're driven and you work hard and you absolutely showed that, then that's super impressive. And I think that's a really inspiring story, but there is that thing, isn't there? That when you get there and you achieve something, which you've aspired to, you're like, wait, if I've done this, have I, is it genuine or do I deserve to be here? Was it not actually that hard? I think that's always that thing, isn't it? It's like when you raise money, you start off looking at it beforehand. You're like, look, I need to raise X million from this. And it's like, it seems so unbelievably unachievable, but then you do it. And as soon as you get there, you're a bit like, fuck, what do I do now? Like, do I deserve to be here? Is this the, the bit I got to? Um, so that's really interesting. And how did you deal with that though? Did you, did it, did it, did that imposter syndrome make you think, did it happen early? We like, actually, should I apply? My grades are good enough to get in, but is it worth me applying? I'm not going to get in. And then you get in and then you're like, oh, fuck, am I actually going to go? Like, was there any of that? Yeah. So before I formally applied, that's when it started to kick in because at the time it wasn't a reality. I hadn't got in. I wasn't going there. But there was this voice at the back of my head saying, come on, back yourself. You can do this. You should apply. But I just thought, 
that there's no chance, you know, me. And it was just the fact that in order to apply to Cambridge or to Oxford, you had to do your personal statement early. And things were done in a slightly different way, which meant that you couldn't do it in silence. People had to know that you were applying. So all of my friends, you know, the people who were saying, oh, you're a thicko a few years earlier, you know, they would all see that. And that was something that was tough for me. And at one point, I actually joined a kind of training session at school for Oxbridge and people were applying to Oxbridge. And the person leading the session said, okay, is anybody here thinking of studying geography? And I was just like, oh no, please don't pick me, please don't pick me. And eventually one of the teachers said, yep, Joe's thinking about studying geography. She was like, okay, Joe, can you stand up please and tell everybody what you learn on a geography field trip? <laughs> You're like, that no, was don't my do that question. To me. Don't do that. Yeah. So simple, right? Yeah. You know, you could say anything. And I stand up and I froze and I just went on and on about how Birmingham tried to rid itself of negative perceptions. Literally, those are the words I use on repeat for around 40 seconds, which is a long time when you're saying the same sequence of words <laughs> over and over again. It was painful. And I'm telling you, I saw people in the room, peers of mine, literally turn their head away from me like this so that they could get their nervous laughter out without having to laugh in my face. And I still remember the specific people who turned and that was awful. It felt so bad. And as soon as that happened, I was like, right, screw this. I'm not applying. I'm not applying to, to Cambridge now. So I left the group. And then after a lot of conversations with one of my geography teachers, Miss Rusey, where she essentially reassured me and said, look, there are so many different types of intelligence. You're, you've got the grades. You know, you can do it. You are bright. Don't listen to what people tell you. You are bright. I just thought, you know what? Screw it, it's my life. You know, I'm the one who's actually going to be in the interview. I'm the one who's going to be in the exams. It's my work. You know, let's try out. And yeah, I mean, that was the end of that. That's where the imposter syndrome kind of started. And then, of course, it was there when I got there as well. But I love that. Like, you know, other people don't control your destiny, right? You do. And I think, like, taking that, there's, this is super controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. There is something about getting banter from your mates that drives you to be better. You know, um, I used to be a big fat fatty and um, officially I can say about myself. And I, when I left uh, when I, in my early 20s and the place I used to work, they used to call me Fat Boy Fairy. Yeah, which is an exceptionally good, you know, play on words for me. And it worked really well because it's alliterative. But the, um, it turned, turned me around. Like I, it just literally, cause I couldn't, I couldn't handle the negativity. I couldn't handle being like, I used to be like a, a tier one athlete and then I let myself go. And then that cut, that really got me going. Now, bullying isn't a good thing. It drove me and got me going. Cause that kind of, that constant berating makes you think, so that's not the identity I want for myself. So my yeah. question on that is, did you realize at the time how big of an impact that was having? Or did you realize in hindsight? I think it's a good question, actually. I think, um, I think it affected me because it wasn't the identity I wanted for myself. You know, I think that's it. When people talk or say things about you, like if someone teases you for something you can change, like if someone had been like, look, you know, um, I don't know, call me short. I'm not short, but I say someone's called me short or whatever. I can't change that. That's really damaging. because There's nothing I can do about that. But it's something I can change. If someone said to me like, um, or like at work when people tease me and be like, Tom, you're so bad at spreadsheets. People say to me all the time, I'm like, fuck you, I'm going to become sensational with spreadsheets. Yeah, like, you know, um, and same again, like you just, I think there's something about that when people say something negative about you, like that's not the identity I want for myself. It is within my control to change that. And the same way that someone said to you that you, you were stupid and you're obviously you weren't, you're like, that's not the identity I want. I know I'm not stupid. And that, I feel that there's something in that that fuels you to, to become the version of yourself that you want to be. Um, and those naysayers and those like, I remember the first time I did stand up, literally no one fucking laughed at me. Literally, I got up on stage and I was like, I, I prepared this, this set and I, it was just like, it was so, it was, I mean, look, I'm going to be honest, it was fucking hilarious. It was amazing. Um, but the way I repeated it, I was like, and I just repeat, I couldn't, I did, couldn't relax and no one laughed at me. And this guy who was promoting the show, this guy, Todd, said to me, he's like, mate, you're not very good at this. Don't do it again. <laughs> it's like, fuck you. Yeah. I'm going to be amazing next time. It really fires you up, doesn't it? There's something about that. Anyway, moving on. Sorry. So we got into, you got into uni, you started this, this, this concept, not your idea, someone else's, but I like you've taken someone else's idea and made it better. That's really what startups do. And so that got you into the social media jam, right? 
what did you do with that? Like, did you, were you thinking at that time, like, I want to turn this into a career or, or like, what were the learnings you took from that whilst you were doing the hustle? Yeah, so whilst I was building that, so it started at Cambridge, we had the students of Cambridge, then I had a friend start one at Oxford, and then we had Durham, Bristol, Exeter, and we had it. Did you own it? Were you like, were you owning this, the, the format? Was it under your banner or were these just people you gave the idea to? So this was all owned. Right. So we had the logo trademarked, which was an absolute waste of time, but it was nice to go through that process. Um, and yeah, in terms of ownership, I mean, I was admin of the pages and I was selecting the other admins, but that's as far as that got. I was thinking about how I could monetize it at the time, but because the, the, the community and the engagement lived on Facebook, I just thought, how can we really monetize this? Unless we're doing kind of the occasional ad, like we can't really monetize it. We don't own the platform. This was my thinking at the time. And so anyway, I decided that for that reason and some other ones, I decided that, you know, this is going to be not for profit. We're going to, we're going to keep this as it is. Um, and that was essentially the end of that. Never made money out of it um, and never truly kind of in my heart wanted to. Um, and then I started a YouTube channel. So at the time... Pause for a second. Sorry, you're on your first gig there. Like, what was it that you think that made it successful? Because like, what do you think allowed it to grow so much? Because uh, you, you're a guy who gets audience creation and engagement. What was it about that that resonated? What was it that people were, why were they listening? We were creating a real authentic face for Cambridge students. You didn't need to be an incredible journalist to be featured on the page. You could be anyone at all. And there was something special around that. And I think it was once we started to think about where the views of the page were coming from, where their followers were coming from within the, you know, the collegiate system at Cambridge, we could then get a little bit more targeted. For example, if we knew that the page was, you know, more or less unheard of at Girton College, which is quite far out from the center of Cambridge, I thought, okay, brilliant. So I'll take a trip down to Girton. I'll speak to the, you know, the captain of the sports team there because I know that they post on social media the whole time and everyone loves their stuff. And if I can get that person on our page, then people are gonna start interacting with that. So it's, you know, a little bit of strategy in, in that respect. Um, but also there were kind of key pillars of social life and almost political life at Cambridge. You had the different papers, you had the Cambridge Union, you had the, I think it was the ADC, the, the, the theater. And it was really about tapping into those and being kind of important within those circles and getting the people from those circles featured on the page, which then helped us leverage the individual audiences and the communities that those people were building up on their own and bring them over to the page. That was just a start. Yeah. Eventually, I thought, okay, I was actually doing an internship in Berlin at the time at a place called Rock Rocket Internet, which are notorious at like a startup clone factory. Um, and at the time, I was obsessed with Gary Vaynerchuk, and he would always hammer what on. King. <laughs> what a king! Yeah. What a king! Yeah. Always hammer on about this idea of the the personal brand. And eventually, I thought, you know what? I already share everything on my personal Facebook and my personal Instagram, but. I'm not really creating any opportunity for scale here. What does that mean there? What does that mean when you say, because I mean, look, you're always banging like we're in the venture game, right? You know, people are always banging on about scale, right? So what does that mean you had, not you, it didn't, and personal, this, we'll get into the nuts here. So personal round one-on-one, -on -one, like you're an expert in it, it's absolutely essential and people don't focus on it enough. We'll come to that later. But when you're saying like, you've got all these things you're doing and you're doing really well, but let me see you're creating a brand for scale or creating content for scale. What does that mean? So with reference to, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk and, you know, that was the start of my YouTube journey. Yeah. In terms of my personal brand, as it was at the time, it was just a classic reputation. Everyone has a personal brand. Everyone has a reputation, but that is confined by the amount of people that they can meet and make an impression on. When you start to create content online and you actively craft your personal brand, you begin to get new eyeballs on your content and on your reputation that you would never have been able to reach otherwise. So that, that's what I mean by scale. Scale within, with regards to personal branding is putting out content that can skyrocket in engagement, get tens of thousands of views within a day. Um, and essentially that allows you to create an aura around yourself, almost a gravitational pull so that people want to come to you. They want to work with you. They want to invite you onto their podcast. They want to hire you. They want to ask you questions. They want to meet for coffee. Whatever it is, you're creating that pull. Um, rather than having to actively engage on a one-by-one -one basis 
and make an impression there. So that's what I mean by scale. It's out of the one-to-ones and in with the, I'm gonna put out content, I'm gonna construct my own platform and I'm gonna create a pool to bring people towards that platform. Amazing. And so let's move straight away into that personal brand thing. So at the moment, I think that one of the most valuable assets you can ever have as a founder is personal brand. Because when you walk into that room to begin with, and actually let's take the Techstars model. Techstars model for investing or finding companies is team, 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 market traction idea. Like your idea is right at the bottom of the list, right? Okay. Um, team is everything. And at the heart, the heart of that team is that founder you know, or two founders or whatever. And so it's so important that if you go into a room and you're pitching to an investor and they're like, I've seen you on LinkedIn. Yeah. I, they Google you and they see you have a brand or a profile. It's going to make a huge difference to someone they haven't heard of. You know, it doesn't mean you're going to get funding, but what it does mean is you're more likely to get funding. I believe that truly. Well, you know, and so the tech stars, and they're the best accelerator on the planet. So, but people don't focus on it because it's really, it's really fucking hard, right? Okay. Where do you start? How do you build it? You live and breathe this. Yeah. Talk me through it. Talk me through that process. Like what do people do and why does it matter? So first of all, on the point of people knowing who you are before you get into the room, yeah. that is the most valuable thing ever. It has changed the game for my business. It changes the game for the clients we work with. And if we think about one specific example, let's take my personal profile. Let's say you see a post of mine on LinkedIn, you see Joe Binder, personal branding for founders and CEOs. And you click onto that, the first thing that hits you right in the face is a photo of me with James Kahn from Dragon's Den and me with Tej Alvani, also from Dragon's Den. Immediately, you know what we do, personal branding for founders and CEOs, and you have immediate validation because, you know, almost I think it's the first or second line makes it clear that they're clients of ours, they've been clients of ours for over two years. And the first thing that happens in your brain is you see this well-known figure who's been on TV for years and then you associate with, sit with this you know, random 25-year-old bloke, which is me, and you think, oh, okay, well, something then happens there in your brain just merely by the fact that these two figures are associated with each other. So then when people message me in the back of their mind or when people meet me in person, they already know that, geez, this guy can be trusted. He's trusted by people who have spent decades crafting their reputation and kind of handed that responsibility over to this guy so so that is huge and it's massively powerful regardless of industry regardless of the business in terms of what is personal branding and how does it work oof, so much fun there's so much to go into yeah um, where where should i start so okay for this start right let's be let's be practical about it right okay so what can people do right okay so you've you you yeah nobody's a nobody but they might but they're unknown for sure so you've got someone who has left their nine to five and they're deciding to go to the 24 seven world that is becoming a founder. Okay. Day one, they don't have a profile. Okay. Then maybe they've got a LinkedIn. Maybe they've got like 500 followers on LinkedIn or whatever, just the generic, they connect with their mates from work or whatever. And a few recruiters, what can they do straight away to start building that profile from the ground up? Sure. Okay. So if we look at this as let's take a LinkedIn profile or a social media profile, um, draw a comparison between a kind of shop window. First thing you want to do if you're starting a new shop, you want the shop window to look pretty. You want to think about the design, you want to think about the different products you have on offer, you want to think about the colors and how welcoming it is. Um, if we think about that with regards to a LinkedIn profile, you want to think about your profile picture. Is this a picture of you clubbing from three years ago, which a lot of the time it is. People just grab whatever photo they have because they don't feel they're photogenic. They've never really, really had any professional photography. Um, so is it that kind of photo or is this a really clean headshot where you're looking directly into the lens of the camera and you're smiling and perhaps there's a bit of a blurred background behind you so that there's a bit of a pop when, when, when people see the photo. Um, you then want to look at the, the banner on, on your profile which is arguably you know, the most valuable bit of real estate that you have on LinkedIn because it just takes up so much space. How are you using that? Are you using it to educate people about the services you offer? Are you using that as a kind of subtle reminder or a subtle indication of your positioning and kind of how influential you are? For example, a really good way of doing that is having a photo of yourself speaking in front of a huge room of people. If you see that instantly, you think, ah, they're a speaker. People respect them. People are listening to them. Um, you think about your tagline. Um, so I've got something descriptive, building personal brands of founders and CEOs. 
The reason I've done that rather than founder at WOW is because I recognize that we're three and a half years old. People don't know what WOW is. And it's never really been a big part of our strategy for them to know what WOW is. I mean, it will be in the future as we start to build our employee brand, but for now it's not. So I'm not gonna waste that real estate on you know, a couple of words, founder and WOW, because that doesn't mean enough to people. That doesn't pull anyone in. Whereas if a founder sees my content on LinkedIn, and they see that tagline, that speaks directly to them. Personal branding for founders, great, I'm a founder and CEO. It's great, I'm a CEO. Um, so that's all the kind of the, the shop window stuff. Of course, you then have the featured section, the about section, um, the experience. But then we have the, the interesting part, which is cool. You have the shop, it looks wonderful and pretty, but how do we actually bring people in? So it's marketing, but in this case, it's marketing for your brand. So you need to put out content, which is gonna draw people towards your profile. Typically, what you'd want to do is ensure that you're going to be consistent with your personal brand. So the way we do that when we work with people is you split their personal brand into two or three topics or pillars or themes that they can talk about consistently. Um, and that essentially forms a basis of their content strategy going forward. So essentially, this is all around creating content. And there's so much more to it. This is the social media side. But then we also have the, you know, featuring on podcasts, doing public speaking and workshops, potentially even getting on TV, getting press. There is so, there's a whole world here and social media is, is a massively vital part to that. Nice. And so for the people who, okay, so that's interesting. So how do we, how do we decide what are the three things they can talk about? And when you're making that decision, are you like, I don't know, sort of like, I can, I can talk about um, probably three things constantly myself. Um, you could talk about three things, but they're probably not of value. I can talk about nineties boy bands, Mongolian history, and a little bit about startups. Like the, how do you decide what is something of value, which is worth talking about and how, how small should people go? Should you be, and also should it be something that is directly related to my business right now? So I'm in the competition space example, like, you know, competition for video games. Um, should I just become an expert in that? Or is that what I should be focusing on? Or is, it, or is it a question of I'm deciding what I want to be known for? Like, what is it? Depends where you are at, at, at yeah. the journey. So if we take somebody who's been on TV, you know, for years as an entrepreneur, they're a completely different um, end of the kind of personal branding spectrum. Compare that to somebody who's just starting a business, thinking about raising some money. They don't have much of a brand. Again, completely different place. So it really depends on that, first of all. And then it's about the audience. Why are you doing this and who are you trying to target? If you know that the people buying your product, the key decision makers who are gonna get you business are founders or their heads of HR or their um, you know, CFOs, then you wanna kind of think about what type of content can appeal to them and then think about what themes you can talk about. So that kind of, this idea of pillars comes after the initial, where am I on that spectrum? And who is the audience and where do they spend time online and what interests them? I love that, I love that. Okay, so I'm gonna spin back a little bit because you just made me think about something. When did you decide that you were gonna start WOW? Because you, you know, you're a founder, you're running a, a successful business and before you were running a YouTube hustle, right? So that was it, you were a YouTuber, okay? That's like, that, that transition from, you know, um, YouTuber to entrepreneur is, I think, a really interesting one because if you speak to, it's really interesting, there was a, a study that came out from Eric, some people came on the show and they were asking, like, if you ask a thousand kids between the age of, like, 13 and 18, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they're like, I want to be an influencer. I want to be a YouTuber because it just seems like the dream hustle. Like, you know, they think that you work for like two hours a day and the rest of the time you're just sunning yourself in Ibiza, right? Probably not the truth of it. And you were success, super successful in that space. And then you decided to move over into running your own business. Talk me through that. Talk to me about the realities of being a, a YouTuber. So first of all, I have a huge amount of respect for YouTubers. These people are not just content creators. They are entrepreneurs. They manage everything, just like a startup founder. 100%. Everything is on you. When you're running a channel and you're starting a YouTube channel, for example, you are the producer, you're the editor, you're the guy who or girl who does the content ideation. You film everything. You manage the community that you're building. You design the merch that you're eventually going to sell. Um, you think about the strategy and how you're going to kind of um, 
pivot where, need, where needed. You identify the trends that you need to jump onto. You analyze the different platforms. Even if you're not there with a spreadsheet thinking, okay, well, my following has only grown by 1% on Instagram this month and on TikTok, it's grown by 20%. Therefore, I need to you know, pivot over to TikTok. Even though it's not as formal as that, these people just get it. That they understand where attention is. So they will make that decision and say, okay, I'm going to drop pushing out good content on Instagram right now and I'm going to focus on TikTok for the next few months because that's where I'm growing the fastest. They make these decisions on an ongoing basis and people just don't recognize that. It's crazy. But in terms of the actual reality, I found it awful. I mean, there were so many things that I loved about it, but there were also some really, really challenging parts. And there were moments when you just had this crippling anxiety about whether or not your audience who are there for you, this is your personality, are gonna stay. And when people don't stay, it's so difficult to not take that as a reflection on yeah. you being a boring person or not being interesting or fun enough. Um, so I also kind of, I can understand, you know, the mental health battles that a lot of YouTubers and influencers face mm. because sure, sometimes they build their audience around a particular niche and the content is less about them and more about what they're kind of projecting and commentating on. But for the most part, their personality is always so integral and vital to the success of the channel, which means that it doesn't, when it doesn't go well, there's very little to blame other than your personality and whether or not people are bonding with that. And that's tough. That's really, really tough. Right. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's super tough. And yeah, in the startup world as well, it's exactly the same. Like when someone doesn't invest in your business, you're like, well, is it because I'm shit? You know, like, is it, you know, and it's not. Yeah, but it might not be your personality. It might be that there's, there's a thousand things it could be, but naturally you're going to think it's you naturally, right? Um, you know, I 100% get that. So on that though, briefly, but you were hugely successful. You had like 21,000 subscribers, right? Yeah. It, again, and this is like a classic thing that somebody, you know, an entrepreneur would say, it's like, okay, but who's defining the, the success? Because... I think when, when the channel was most active, we had 22,000 followers, over 2 million views collectively. But for me, you know, that wasn't 3 million subscribers and millions and millions of views every and week. And that's what success was. You defined that as success. Yeah, I mean, I never thought that, well, actually, I probably did think that my YouTube career failed. Um, but I mean, ultimately, in hindsight, yeah, I mean, built a big audience. Um, which, which was great and I learned a ton and it was those learnings I was then able to transfer to actually starting a business and I got the first few clients of wow because I was able to say look you know look at all these videos on YouTube look at these comments that people are leaving look at these pages that have been created around the community that we're building I can build a personal brand I've done it for myself let me do it for you what were the two things that you learned from there about growing that audience what were the two things that were the absolutes like yeah this is really key to making this work? The first thing is the branding and how you package something online. The second thing was creating a movement. So creating movement? Creating a movement. A movement, okay. So on the first thing, I had so many examples where I would record a video, let's say it was a Q&A video, and it'd be 19 minutes long, just me staring directly into the lens of the camera, answering questions. And then I thought, actually that's too long for one video, I'm gonna split it into two. In each segment, I spoke about Cambridge University. I spoke about going on holiday, you know, this one time in Spain. I spoke about a load of other topics. And I remember uploading them in slightly different ways. One was about this time, you know, in Lanzarote. And that was a title and that was the kind of framing of the thumbnail. The other one was about how I got into Cambridge. I spoke about how I got into Cambridge in both, but one of those videos got 8,000 views after a few weeks. The other one got over 40,000 views. The only difference was the fact that one was branded for somebody who was interested in university in Cambridge and it was making it easy for them to click onto it. Right. And the other was like, you know, who's, who's interested in, uh, you know, the time I got lost in Spain. It's not yeah, really. Yeah. Um, so that was one thing. And the positioning there is, I mean, so many learnings on that one, which can be kind of taken forward into personal branding all the way down to when you're speaking on a podcast, if that's something you really want to kind of show off and make it seem like it's a big deal, then it's not just uh, great to be featured, it's uh, I'm honored to, be, to have been invited onto yeah, this. Sure. And you kind of build that um, hype for people who don't understand the hype and you kind of set the scene for them. Whole load of learnings in there. The second thing is on building a movement. Um, 
a lot of YouTubers will have a name for their community, their, their following. If you think about how many times Logan Paul will shout the words maverick, be a maverick, whenever he has airtime. You know, that, that's his people, that's what they want to be. Um, that is massively powerful because the second you take yourself out of the equation and you allow this kind of community to form around you and this movement and you give it a name, then everyone can get behind that. Um, and one really simple kind of growth hacky example of that was when, oh, very embarrassing, for whatever reason, our community was called the Moss Gang. Oh, the Moss Gang. Classic name, right? Yeah. And I remembered Cambridge University's Instagram page were doing a feature on me. So they were putting up a video, which I'd created for them. And I thought, okay, they have half a million followers. If I really want this video that they're posting to reach a lot of people, I've got to be the first person to, to comment on that. And I've got to make sure loads of other people do. And sure, I can ask 10 friends to comment on it as soon as Cambridge University's Instagram releases a video of me. Um, but ultimately, we need more on that. Now, bear in mind, the typical video that they were sharing at the time was getting like, I don't know, 10, 15,000 views. Um, so what I did is I fired up the whole of our community, the, the Moss Gang, um, and encouraged everyone as soon as it dropped, and I knew the time that it was dropping, to jump onto that video and just spam it with comments of like a green leaf emoji, which was our sign. And all of a sudden, I wasn't, you know, Joe Binder wasn't asking a favor to the people that followed him. It was the Moss Gang going all guns blazing to promote this video. And as a result, oh, I can't remember how many comments, but that video got tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of views. And as a result, people who wouldn't have seen it, people who followed the University of Cambridge, but wouldn't have seen it on their newsfeed, therefore did see it. Yeah. Because of Instagram's algorithm basically said, this is really popular, people are liking this, let's continue to push it out to that half a million followers. And as a result, I reaped the benefits of that with a load of new followers. So that is one example of, you know, what it means to create a movement and a community and mobilize it. Sensational. I love it. It's a really good hack as well. Um, and of course, a growth hack is always just someone who experiments lots of times to figure out what works. Yeah. Um, so what made you make the leap? So it wasn't going the way you wanted it to. And you're like, but I've taken some learnings from this. I know about the power of building personal brand, I'm going to go and do this as a full-time hustle. Yeah. What was it? What was the problem you saw that you thought that you could solve? So it was actually after I'd kind of decided not to pursue YouTube in that way. And it was when I was working at a social media startup. Um, I was there for five and a half months. I don't typically, I don't talk about this often, but I'm more than happy to talk about it. Um, five and a half months until the company essentially ran out of money. But whilst I was there, I saw that there was one client who was paying, you know, a good amount of money for individual content, content for her LinkedIn. And I understood the purpose of why we were doing it, but the model was broken. I was writing the content. I'm not a, a writer, I'm not a copywriter. I'm not very good at writing. And my colleague who's an editor, he was also writing the content. It made no sense. And I was thinking about the salaries that we were being paid to write this content on behalf of somebody else. It just didn't work. And she wasn't getting results. And you know there was so much more that was happening that was going wrong. I thought, if there was a proper system behind this, this could be brilliant. And that woman who's paying that amount of money every month would be getting, you know, would be making that all back in no time. Um, and then when it came to making a decision to start my own business after that, I thought, you know what, I've got some credentials now for myself in terms of building up an audience. I have a rough, idea, a very basic idea of what a, you know, the internals of a business looks like. Not a good idea. I was only there for a few months. I thought, you know what? I was a kid at school who used to sell you know, headphones from China and Blackberry phone cases and sweets. You know, I've always been interested in entrepreneurship. First job was when I was 10 at a garden center. I, I've wanted this for so long. Now is the time. So I started, wow. I like hearing stories about people going to startups that fail because no one comes out of that experience not being richer for it yeah because you go in and like you see like it's a cliche they run out of money right and the reason they run out of money is because they didn't have an offering that didn't work that they couldn't sell they didn't have there's loads of factors that cause it if they couldn't raise money, whatever there's lots of factors that mean you run out of money people are always a bit like oh they just ran out of money no there are they did something else wrong which meant that they couldn't raise or generate um but you become richer for it and it's interesting you saw that problem so when you started WOW, like what was, the, what was the mission? So if we go back to when we discussed hard work earlier, yep. I think we both agreed that 
hard work equals success, it pays dividends. I think the thing that is often missed within the various narratives around entrepreneurship is when you start a business and you don't have much industry expertise, a lot of the time you don't know what hard work looks like. You may really, really want to work hard. You may be willing to trade every waking hour for that work, but you may not know what that looks like. And that's what the first six or seven months of WOW looked like because I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to work with individuals. I knew I wanted to help elevate their, their, their brands and make them more influential online, but I didn't really know how to actually set up a business around that. I didn't know how to get clients. I was spending yeah. a, just a strange amount of time trying to organize a rotor system for people from different universities to intern and write a blog that would go onto our awful website. And that was taking up so much of my time because I thought, okay, well, if we have a good website, then people are going to see that and then they'll become a client. It's all so wrong. Um, and so there was a lot of time at the very start where I had to figure out what works and figure out what to work hard on. So that was a really kind of interesting phase, also quite a difficult and lonely phase because you're doing that almost in a vacuum. There's no one around you when you're a solo founder. Exactly. And your, own, your only measure of like whether you're doing it wrong is failure. It's a real pain. And like, I hate that thing that people talk about. It's a, it's a real problem on LinkedIn. I think it's all a lot. We say, yeah, you just got to hustle. Yeah, you just got to hustle. And you're like, but hustle doing what? Do you know what I mean? It's like when people talk about, um, I'm a big fan of Medium and I like writing on Medium. And you read it and people are like, this is how I got my first thousand followers on Medium or whatever. And you're like, yeah, I just wrote every single day. I'm like, about what? Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, stop telling me to just hustle. Like, this isn't valuable. Like, working hard. Who had this hold me there? I don't work hard, work smart. That's bollocks. Do both. Yeah, do you mean like you can do both? Um, and I love your honesty there about the fact that it is it's super lonely. And the loneliness comes from the fact that you don't know if you're doing a good job. Yeah, it's not like we can all work on our own. We can all work in isolation. Like we've all been through that. But like, it's that someone tell me if I'm doing this right. Yeah. There was a time when a client picked up on the fact that I was, I don't know what it was. I was a bit dazed. Yeah. You know, working on my own, trying to make his campaign a success. And he just looked at me and said, Joe, you are enough. And I swear to you, it sounds <laughs> so cringe to say, I nearly cried I in it. front of him. Yeah. I don't know what it was, but that just hit home. And I was like, oh my God, wow. Um, but anyway, in terms of tangible value bits of advice, there was one thing that a guy called David Goldberg said to me, which was brilliant. Um, at the time, I was, it was just me. And I was thinking, okay, well, you know, Yes, I'm really busy, but I'm busy editing these videos and I'm busy doing this graphic design. So I don't have time to get new clients. And he was like, right, what's your, what's your hourly rate? And I was like, I have no idea. And he was like, okay, it's hundred pounds an hour. And I was like, no, it's not, come on, that's way too high. He's like, no, that's not the purpose. What we're doing here is thinking about your time and the value of your time with regards to getting in new business. So let's say it's hundred pounds an hour. How much does it cost for an editor to edit that video? So I know, 20 pounds an hour. And it takes you how long? It takes two hours. He's like, hey, great. Now compare those two numbers. If you want to grow this business and if you want to start scaling this business, then you have to start thinking about your time through this lens. It is the only way. You should not be editing videos. You should not be filming videos. You shouldn't be doing graphic design. You need to bring people in around you to fill up those slots so that you can spend your time in the most valuable area of the business. And right now for you, that is getting new business in. That was a gem. That really changed the trajectory of the business. I there. Uh, do you know what? Like, I'm so glad. The the discussion around false economy of startups drives me mad. You know, like um, I at the beginning was spending so much time doing stuff that just it it's just process. It's just process. I wasn't adding any value to this. Anybody on the planet could do that. Not anyone on the planet can go and hire people. Not anyone on the planet can inspire someone to spend money with you. Not anyone on the planet can choose the vision of your business yeah, or go and win new business. So that's what you should be doing. If that's like that metric, if, you, if people are like, oh, I'm saving money, I'm hustling, I'm bootstrapping, you're, you're not. You're actually slowing down the growth of your business and you're costing yourself more money in the long term. Okay, we're getting to the end of the show, running out of time here, which is a shame because I'm enjoying this. I've got two questions for you. One, how the fuck did you win clients the size of James Kahn and Tej Navani when you are only two years into this hustle? What, I mean, how do you, how does that happen? How do you get such tier one clients so early on? So James Kahn became a client, I think it was month seven. All right, hustle, humble brag. <laughs> at a time when I was 
thinking about ending the business and actually applying to other companies because at that point, you know, I said there was this time period of six or seven months where I just didn't really know what I'm doing, what I was doing. It got to a point where I was like, okay, you know, no one to quit. This isn't working. Get over yourself. Get a job. But anyway, we can save that for another time. I posted an article on LinkedIn whinging about the lonely reality of a 21-year-old entrepreneur. And it got a lot of good traction. Um, people really appreciated the honesty and the transparency of it all. And one person commented saying, hey, Joe, just want to reassure you, it's no different when you're 40. Um, age just doesn't matter with this kind of stuff. It's lonely for all of us. Why don't we meet for a coffee? That person then very quickly became a mentor to me and taught me that gem of advice that I told you before. So this guy's name was David Goldberg. Um, and he also, I found out once we met, his company was backed by James Kahn. And I showed where I was like, wow, that would be a game changer. And he was like, oh, maybe, maybe in, in time. And then eventually as that relationship with David grew and he started to help me more, I started to help him more. And he started to see the value that I, at the time, which was just me, could, could bring. He was like, okay, great. Um, this, this could be interesting. I might mention this to James. And I was like, oh my goodness. Anyway, next morning I had an email intro to James Cotton um, and the rest was history and oh, negotiating with him. Oh my goodness, what a moment. And obviously, you know, we've been working together for now, whatever the mass is, nearly three years, um, two and a half, three years. And the consistent go, he loves it. He loves to negotiate. And it's just amazing practice as well. And a, a, also a great guy, right? Genuinely, yeah. so I think some great to have on. And did he introduce you to Tej? He didn't introduce me to Tej. So at the moment we're working with, um, there are three dragons that we can speak about that we work with. Some of our clients like to be kept under, kind of of under wraps. Um, one of, so yeah, Tej was through a set completely separate. Um, did you go direct or you got intros? That was an intro? Yep. Sara was kind of through Tej actually, yeah. It, nice. we, we met. Um, I met all the dragons at a, an event with Tage when I was there. Met Sara there, had a brief conversation, and then a year or so after that, that turned into turned into her being a client. Fantastic. All right, okay. Two more questions. So we wrap up. You've had, like, you know, what twenty five, and you've got the experience of someone who's been doing this for hundred years. It's amazing. What is the one piece of advice you give to anyone at any stage? No, not any stage, it's super early stage. Somebody's thinking about starting a business, okay? All right, and they're going through that. What would you, what's one piece of advice that you would give to every single founder? People listening may not like this. However, I would say if you're thinking about starting a business and if you have the opportunity to work for somebody, take that opportunity, start the business after. And I know that may feel like it's contradicting some of the things that, I, that I've said. And I feel like this is going to be something that in a year or so, I'm going to completely change my mind about and think, you know what, 100% get out there, start the business, learn, 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 because there's so much to be said for that. But at the same time, I learned so many things from, you know, four and a half, five and a half months in a startup beforehand. So many of the, you know, what not to do's and so many of the, you know, things that you should do. And if I had more experience in that, it would have completely fast-tracked the growth that we've, ha we've had. So on the one hand, you could say, okay, three and a half years, there are now six going on, eight people in the business. We've got you know, lots of you know, happy clients, good retaining, um, good recurring revenue. But ultimately, even understanding how to probably pitch to a client, how to manage a client properly, how to manage somebody on your team without micromanaging. You know, there's so much that you would learn from, from working at a company with a good manager. Um, and I saw, I'm going to stop rambling, but that, that is the overarching theme there. If you can get the experience and then start a business. I think that's great advice. And yeah, and I absolutely echo that. I tried to start three businesses, all flopped. And then I worked for a startup as part of the founding team. And, um, it, that kind of safety net, that kind of surrounding of being around something from nothing to something and seeing that process you go through with the safety net and then going and doing your own thing is absolutely a sensational way to do it. Great. Second piece of advice. What's one fuck up you made throughout this process that you hope that no one else made? Mine would be the first hire I made. Um, I didn't really, sorry, just to be clear, it was not a mistake making the hire. 
the mistake there was me not putting enough effort and trying to learn how to be a manager before they actually joined because I just wasn't a good manager to them at all. Um, the way I would delegate responsibilities, it was very much um, having somebody there to help with stuff rather than having somebody there to, to own segments or parts of the business. And that's what they were there to do. But I was never able to properly give them ownership because, well, I mean, it was towards, towards the end, but essentially I just found it difficult and the delegation kind of process there was just all wrong so that was a definite learning for me like if 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 you're going through something big as a business for example a first hire seek as much advice as you possibly can and then also try to create an environment where you are mentally there on their first day you know a month before the first day happens so you think okay well, this is the first time this person is walking into this office this is a new job for them how would they be feeling what kind of guidance, reassurance would they expect? What kind of physical, you know, tangible resources could be useful for, for them? What would their first week actually look like? What would their second, third, fourth week actually look like? How would they physically onboard a client and, and so on? There's a lot of things that I should have done before that first hire joined, which would have made the process much better. But on, on the flip side, in hindsight, you know, that was a crash course in management. So that was really good. Yeah, exactly. Makes perfect sense. Joe, it's been great. How can people find you? How can they get in contact? Joe Binder on social media, uh, Joe Binder 96 on Instagram. Only thing is I have one request where if people follow me, um, they're not allowed to follow me unless they send me a message to introduce themselves. It's something I've done for a while. It's something I learned in my YouTube days. It's amazing to have people follow you, but as more people follow you, you start to kind of lose the face of the people who are actually you know, there you were actually following along with your content. So what I love is when people send me a message to say, hey, you know, this is my name, this is where I'm from. Even as something as simple as that, you know, I heard you on the podcast, etc. just means that I can actually understand who is there on the journey with me. If you do want to join, then yeah, drop me a message on Instagram or on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, I look forward to hearing from you. Cool. All right, great. Thanks so much for coming on. It's been great. Thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful.